Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan's virtual town hall. My name is Mike Anderson, and I'll be today's moderator. In just a few moments, I'll kick it over to the senators for some very brief opening remarks to kick it off. But before I do, I'd like to take a few moments to let everyone know that if you'd like to ask a question during this town hall, please press star 3 at any time, and you'll be connected with an operator. Again, if you'd like the opportunity to ask a question this afternoon, please press star 3 to enter the queue. With that, I'll turn the call over to Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all the Alaskans on the line uh, this evening or late this afternoon, your time. Uh, Senator Sullivan and I have been holding these, these weekly town halls for, for a month now, and I think we have found them very valuable in connecting with folks and uh, hearing their concerns and issues and trying to be responsive, providing answers uh, to your questions as to how we can access resources and, and deal with the impacts of, of this pandemic. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are still many unanswered questions. The situation is continuing to evolve, as you know, uh, back in the state and, and really around the country. So we continue to feel different, different concerns, different situations every week. We have uh, been taking this uh, really in, in, in phases of federal response um, with, with early money towards, towards research and, and, and funding, towards testing and vaccine, and then the, the direct assistance, and now more recently with the CARES Act, providing uh, stabilization help um, for states, uh, uh, local governments, healthcare providers, um, and then again, direct support to individuals, students, schools, small business owners, and their employees and, and nonprofits. So you've, you've heard a lot about the CARES Act. Um, you've probably also heard that uh, the, the two um, uh, most, most utilized programs um, that we're hearing about are the Paycheck Protection Program uh, through the Small Business uh, Administration. Um, uh, we have we have heard the need clearly. Uh, Alaska has um, about 99% of our businesses are defined as small businesses, and so when you are impacted this directly, because effectively the, the tourism industry is 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 closed off or or uh, through through order of of the, the the government, you've been you've been shut down. Uh, volumes have de decreased. You haven't been able to to keep your your employees on. Um, we've been trying to address uh, many aspects of this with uh, with regards to these small business programs. We we heard very very clearly the concerns from our seasonal workers, our seasonal businesses, with regards to the PPP, the Paycheck Protection, as it was initially outlined. Um, worked very very hard to to make uh, uh, changes uh, to address the seasonal aspect of so many of our businesses. So it was earlier this week on Monday that uh, the Treasury Department announced this rule change that enables the seasonal businesses to choose a different 12-week expense period when you're applying for your PPP so that it more accurately reflects the operating payroll and thus the, the amount of your loan. That was something we heard from you. Um, but we knew going in that this was something that we needed to address. But the delegation worked very hard to to uh, uh, to to make that change and uh, ensure that our seasonal employers are going to be able to to have some assist to help their businesses and and to keep their employees on the payroll. Uh, the economic injury disaster loan, the EIDL, I wish that we could say uh, we are having better success with. Um, at the time that the program ran out of money, uh, a couple, well, ten days or so ago. Uh, only eight loans had been uh, processed to the state of Alaska. There were uh, 2,700 uh, advance grants, and that's good, but uh, the EIDL for us is not working the way that we would like, and we hear your concerns about that. Right now, that portal isn't even open to, to receive new applications, and uh, uh, both Senator Sullivan and I have been speaking with the Secretary of Treasury about the defects in this program. Many have asked about unemployment insurance. Last week at our town hall, we had uh, the Director of the Unemployment uh, Compensation Division in Alaska and the Secretary, uh, the 
Commissioner of Labor um, uh, on the program as well, uh, updating us on the the expanded uh, unemployment benefits that have gone out. I think it is important to note that uh, that the uh, expanded program for the self-employed independent contractors and gig workers was activated on Friday. Um, we're told that uh, those payments to that expanded group should be going out within about a week. So I know people have been waiting on that. And to the state's credit, they got that, uh, they got that up and running earlier than they thought they might. Um, and then there's the direct assistance that has been going out to, to individuals uh, around the state. Um, nationwide, we understand that it's been about, it's been over uh, $88 million in, in directed assistance payments that have gone out from Treasury. Uh, so that is continuing to be pushed out the door. But if you have specific questions about that, we can speak to that this evening too. So in the Senate, we're going to be back, uh, we're going to be back in session on Monday. Uh, we will convene and have opportunities to to uh, to debate what comes next, and so the opportunity to hear from you folks tonight to understand your specific situation, the concerns, and how we can continue to address the the impacts uh, to you and your families and businesses is what we're here to do. So, looking forward to your questions tonight. Now, I'll turn it over to Dan. Well, thank you, Lisa, and uh, I want to thank all the Alaskans who are on the line. Um, I'm actually calling from my home in Anchorage. Uh, I got home uh, uh, last weekend after the CARES Act 2.0 was signed into law and uh, and in quarantine here with my wife and daughters. And uh, like so many of you, we're all facing these unprecedented challenges. I want to thank so many of our leaders throughout the state. Everybody has been playing a role, not easy. Everybody's been sacrificing uh, through these challenging times. One of the things that we are focused on is continuing to try to get federal resources uh, to as many Alaskans as possible as uh, people in our state are struggling uh, to deal with these very, very serious challenges. And we're doing that through several different uh, streams. And we want to continue to hear from all of you uh, with regard to how you're seeing the implementation, some of the specific challenges uh, that you're seeing, and then, of course, individual casework that um, you or your families or your small businesses uh, might need. Our staffs are uh, working closely together, and uh, I always say we, we can't promise that we'll fix the problem, but we certainly can commit to putting uh, all the time and effort we can uh, into helping your individual issues uh, that our teams are doing a working around the clock to try and help their fellow Alaskans. You know, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, of course, legislation this size for the whole country is going to hit snafus, bureaucratic roadblocks. Uh, again, hearing from all of you on that can help us focus our efforts with the federal government uh, on where we need to do uh, our job to help all of you. Uh, just a couple areas in particular where we've been very focused, you know, as we've talked about on the individual side, families, individuals, the economic impact payments from the IRS um, have been dispersed or being dispersed. And again, uh, I think a majority of Alaskans have received these, but uh, there's many who haven't. It's still frustrating um, uh, whether you didn't have direct deposit for your tax filing or other uh, areas with regard to how this is implemented. Uh, we certainly want to help you with that. Uh, there is actually a, um, if you Google IRS get my payment, uh, that can help you with regard to providing the extra information to the IRS if you haven't received one of those checks. As Senator Murkowski mentioned, we replenish the Paycheck Protection Program and uh, importantly worked with the Treasury Department to get a fix that 
the delegation really uh, drove to enable seasonal businesses, which are so many of our small businesses, to be able to apply for a loan based on how many employees they had last summer, not now. The PPP uh, loan amount is a function of how big your your uh, payroll base is and having the ability to use last summer's a 12-week period from last summer in terms of your employees will enable our small businesses to get much bigger uh, PPP loans, which we think will be important. With regard to fisheries, uh, as we, we talked about earlier, several elements of the CARES Act, the unemployment insurance, the PPP uh, regulations are focused on trying to help our fisheries, whether commercial or sport or charter, and uh, there's also a fund that was in the original CARES Act of $300 million for direct assistance to those impacted. We expect the federal government, NOAA, and NIMS to come out with those uh, formulas on how that $300 million is going to be uh, divided up. We believe, as we've been uh, working with these federal agencies on the formulas, that we should see a significant portion of that money coming to our state, given that we, given that we are the superpower of seafood with over 60% of all seafood harvested in America comes from Alaska. But we are monitoring that closely, and we'll get the word out as soon as the feds do on how to apply uh, for that relief that we know so many in our coastal communities and fishing communities uh, need relief on. Um, the energy sector, of course, uh, has also been hammered by this pandemic, and uh, uh, we want to. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I just I just want to say to all the families and workers in in that sector of the economy who are experiencing difficult times, we have been trying to work through many of the challenges um, on that front. Uh, I think. Some of you have seen the work we have been done, doing pressuring Saudi Arabia, which decided to undertake dramatic production increases, which dropped the price of energy globally uh, uh, in a way that significantly impacted our state in a very negative way. Uh, we've been have, having very frank discussions with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on their actions, and uh, that could lead, from my perspective, to uh, you know, a pull out of our military forces from those countries, from that country in particular, if they're not uh, working in a way that's much more constructive. And um, we're also starting to look at some of the big banks in America who uh, openly discriminate against uh, investment in Alaska, which is going to hurt us long term. So these are some of the issues that we're working on and trying to address. The final one on the energy side, the Federal uh, Federal Reserve just uh, amended its what they call their Main Street Lending Program. This is for uh, businesses above the small business loan um, PPP coverage that, again, could apply to bigger uh, companies in Alaska that need uh, assistance during these challenging times in the energy sector and other parts of our economy. So those are the, some of the key issues. Again, we wanna hear from you as uh, I'll be heading back to DC in a couple days and uh, the Senate will be in session and uh, we need to hear from all of you ready to try to address some of the particular challenges that you're seeing on the ground and uh, how we can get through this pandemic stronger, more resilient. But I again wanna thank everybody for the incredible sacrifice and hard work. Our state's economy is finally starting to open up, which I think is a hopeful sign. And hopefully that uh, uh, starts to happen throughout the country as well. Thank you, Senators. Once again, for listeners looking to ask a question today, please press star three to be placed in the queue. Again, that's star three to be placed into the queue. Uh, with that, we're gonna go to the phones and first up is Michelle Walker. Who has a question for the senators? Go ahead. Um, I want to say thank you for all the hard work you've done. Um, 
and to be honest with you, listening to Senator Murkowski and Sullivan, um, you've answered a lot of my questions and said a lot of things, but I feel it's really important. I've listened in on all the town meetings and never been in the queue. I guess, you know, a lot of people wanted to say things. My situation is pretty dire. Um, I'm 69 years old. I have stage four kidney disease. I have diabetes. I have high blood pressure. Now, saying that, all of that is under control really well, and I have a really good independent business. Um, But I see clients in my home. Well, as soon as the COVID came out, I am in the high, high risk place. I can no longer see clients. I haven't seen clients. Um, I quit seeing my clients the beginning of March. Um, So I have not worked for almost two months, and that's my job. Um, And I don't qualify for paycheck protection, the EIDL loans. Um, I put in for the unemployment when the state said independent contractors could do that, and they have taken my form, and I've sent in the thing for the past two weeks, but I've heard nothing from them on that quarter. I haven't received a stimulus check although I do have automatic deposit with my Social Security. And every day I read in the news about another million-dollar company getting millions of dollars to bail them out of their problems. I've lived in Alaska for 50 years, and I support local. I don't buy from Amazon or do any of that. I support the local merchants. And I love Fairbanks, and I love Alaska, but (laughs) let me tell you, I am in a world of hurt. So what would you suggest for me? Well, Michelle, um, I'll I'll just start off by um, just acknowledging the the, the frustration that is clearly uh, evident as you're, you're outlining uh, your situation there. Um, you know, you say you've got an independent business. It was probably, you were probably doing just fine before uh, the, the, the coronavirus hit. And, uh, and, and, and now you don't have a source of income and you're limited in your ability to, to bring that in, that income back in if you have your own uh, health complications and thus are vulnerable to this virus. So the, the, uh, the, the first thing is, is, is clearly the unemployment insurance. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that you have applied. Uh, as I mentioned, you are in this category. Uh, they call it the pandemic unemployment assistance. This is this expanded uh, UI for the self-employed, the independent contractors. So this was just activated last Friday, so not even a week ago, and they, uh, they are now working to get these payments out. So if you have been accepted into this system, as I understand, you should be getting uh, your first unemployment um, uh, check within a- about a week. Again, this is sooner than they thought they would have the system up, but um, uh, it is it is it will be in place i i believe also and i i'm I'm hoping that i'm giving it accurate here but i believe that when we had the unemployment director on last week she indicated that um you will receive uh your unemployment insurance uh that that goes back from the from the date of your eligibility for it. So it would not just be like the first week. So um, that that will be a uh, help. I guess you you say you're not eligible for the PPP, and and I'm not sure why you would not be. Um, it, uh, obviously, PPP is one of the one of the prime considerations is is, is the desire to the design to be able to keep. Um, keep your employees uh, with you on the payroll, you may not have any. And so maybe the PPP is not the best program, although it would still allow uh, 
allow a limited um, amount for a loan for for uh, the cost of of just the, the the monthly operation of your your business, your utilities, your mortgage, the like. Um, uh, EIDL. Uh, I I wish that I could be more um, assertive in in recommending that as an option. But in fairness, um, it has been so difficult to see results for Alaskans with this with this plan. In my conversation with the Secretary of Treasury today about just this issue. I said, I, I don't want to direct people there if, if the program is not going to, um, to be functioning in a way that's going to be helpful to them. And his assurance was they are, having, they are having issues with the rollout. They don't want it to be as bad as, as the startup of the, of the replenished PPP fund um, this week. And so they're, they're taking this one a little bit slower. He heard the concern. Um, but in fairness, we haven't seen the results in, in Alaska that we, we want out of that. Um, I, I also want to share with you and with others, we talk a lot about the relief through, uh, through the CARES Act. I think it is important to know that on the state side, through the state stabilization funds, this is the $1.25 billion that is, 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 is directed to the state, so the, uh, the the governor and and the legislature are working now um, to determine those allocations. But but the state also uh, is is emphasizing uh, the impact to our small businesses. And the governor's proposal was three hundred million dollars to Alaska small businesses that the SBA SBA loans are not covering. So that may be. Uh, uh, even a better option and alternative for you. So, Michelle, I just want to uh, mention that um, uh, again. I'm, I'm I'm very sorry that you're you're going through these challenging times. You're right to be careful, though. You you did describe yourself as somebody who, um, you know, when you look at the data, is particularly vulnerable to this uh, virus. So, I think being Cautious the way you have been is very uh, smart. And again, um, you should feel free to be reach reaching out to our team, uh, our teams on these kind of issues. Um, but a couple things, uh, we have gotten word, and and again, this is what I talked about at the top. These bureaucratic snafus. Uh, if you're a Social Security recipient, you would think that it would be pretty darn easy for the Feds to get you your economic uh, recovery check. Uh, that hasn't been the case. We have been hearing, even though a lot of these checks have gone out, that Social Security recipients are taking longer. We're tracking that, but those should be coming out soon. And if you're a Social Security recipient, there's nothing you uh, are supposed to even have to do with that. One thing you can do is, you know, on the website, irs.gov, there is a, uh, a check your payment status tool that you can use to see uh, your status. Uh, if you, I believe you, you enter your proper information. As Senator Murkowski also mentioned, um, uh, the unemployment insurance, you clearly, clearly are, uh, uh, covered by the broader CARES Act uh, unemployment. And even if you wanted to, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, there, there's opportunities there. It wouldn't be a huge loan, but the PPP program does cover independent contractors um, and uh, people in your situation. So that's something else that, in my view, unless there's something, uh, you know, out there that, uh well, just in my view, I think that you should be qualified for that. So we're here in early May on the Social Security uh, uh, recipients who are waiting on their uh, economic uh, recovery check, their personal check. And on these other issues, again, if you don't hear or you have problems, you can always reach out to our offices uh, for additional assistance. 
Yeah, before we go to the next one, Mike, I just want to to, to add on to that because um, in addition to what uh, Senator Sullivan has just said, that Social Security um, uh, filers should should be seeing something in their accounts by um, early May, no later than May 5th is what we are told. We're also told that veterans um, benefit recipients should also begin receiving their stimulus payments by early May. So uh, I know there, we might have some of our, of our veterans who had a similar question in terms of when they might expect it. So we're told it should be uh, by this first week in May. All right, thank you, Senators. Next up, we're gonna to go to Bill Snesnowski in Anchorage. He's got a question. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Sure can. Go ahead, Bill. Yes, I can oh, hear you, Bill. I, I heard briefly on one of the other um, uh, shows where people asked a question about driving in and out of Alaska, and uh, you said you were working on it, and I was wondering if you could give me a follow-up on that. And um, I read the Anchorage Daily News regularly, and I haven't seen – that subject mentioned or addressed at all in all the discussion about COVID-19. Yeah, so the the uh, the U.S. Canadian border um, is is partially it's subject to a partial closure due to COVID, and and what that means is that non-essential travel is being limited. That uh, partial closure. Um, was through the 21st of, of April. By mutual agreement, um, it was extended an additional 30 days, so this will take it into mid-May. Uh, what, what they define by um, uh, es essential travel is making sure that um, uh, food and fuel and, and supplies necessary, uh, those, that trucking of all of that will be allowed. What they're trying to discourage is, is leisure travel, um, uh, leisure travel and I guess recreation. I don't know what the difference between leisure and recreation, but um, uh, what we have been doing is um, uh, kind of monitoring the situation, people will call our offices and say, I'm, I've, been, I've been living down in Arizona all winter long. This is the time of year that I come back every year. Can I drive, can I drive home? And um, we, have, we have worked with uh, those people that have called and um, are told that their travel is not interrupted, that they can continue that. Um, and so it is, it is something that, uh, uh, again, I don't think they're, they're encouraging travel that, uh, uh, that is just kind of deciding that you want to go and, and sightsee through through Canada right now and ultimately end up in Alaska. That is, is is being discouraged and not allowed, but there is no limitation on the the essential travel um, that would allow for the flow of commerce and also to facilitate uh, workers who uh, may go back and forth across the border on a very frequent basis. So um, you're right, I haven't seen that much in the newspapers, which must mean that um, that folks are able to do what they need to do uh, without um, making the front page of the newspaper. So Bill, just to add on to uh, what Senator Murkowski mentioned, you know, the, um, the US, Mexico and Canada on April 20th uh, reached an agreement to restrict non-essential travel uh, for 30 additional days. And uh, Canada, um, uh, like um, uh, Alaska, has a mandatory 14-day quarantine for all people entering their country. Um, so it doesn't appear they're strictly enforcing that for Alaskans trying to return home. 
And um, right now we have not seen the U.S. denying entry if, um, if they make it to the Alaska border in less than 14 days. As you know, it doesn't normally take nearly that long. So this is kind of the, the thing that we've been hearing. Um, they, uh, the, they are allowing trailers and RVs through to return to Alaska. You have to show your, uh, you know, uh, documents that indicate you're going home. But here's kind of the, the catch on that. They're generally re- requiring that they, that the travelers be entirely self-contained, meaning that they have their food, their water supplies on hand uh, already, that they can stop only at, you know, gas stations, no grocery stores, no hotels, no drive throughs uh, supposedly no interacting with any Canadians, and there are fines and jail time that um, you could bump up against if you uh, don't abide by that. So that means if people are driving through in, in an RV or a trailer, you obviously have it a little easier if you have all these self-contained things and can sleep. If you're just in a car, You need to be prepared to just keep driving and, you know, have the appropriate gear, sleep in your car, as well as have all the food and water supplies. Um, Our office, our offices can help on a case-by-case basis. We were literally on the phone today with DHS and a constituent trying to help this individual get through a a crossing uh, between Canada and the United States. So we are ready to help in this regard, but that's the latest information we have. All right. Thank you, Senators. Next up, we're going to go to Caitlin Jarrett in Skagway who's got a question. Senators, um, sorry, I didn't get asked this question earlier. Um, I promised that this Senator in Skagway I would, and then I didn't, so I'm following through. My question um, would be, or comment would be, um, I know a lot of Alaskans haven't been successful with the EIDL. He happens to be a, a large business owner in Skagway, and he can't get a consistent answer on what the cap amount for the EIDL is. Um, you know, we're all told it's $2 million, but when he talks to people at the um, SDA and uh, large business owners who have received the grant, um, they've been capped at 500000 and he's really hoping to access to two million and, and wondering if you guys can comment on that or check it out when you go back to the Capitol. So what what I know um so with with EIDL we we appropriated um twenty billion dollars in total for for the loans in these last two funding bills um which offers up to two uh two million in in assistance. Um so uh, these these can be used to pay your your fixed debt, your payroll accounts payable, um, uh, anything that can't be paid because of of the disaster's impact. Um, interest rate is 3.75 for small businesses. Uh, for nonprofits, it's 2.75. Um, uh, so I think that should answer the question in terms of what the cap is. The cap would be two million uh, under those terms. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned in the in my um, initial comments, uh, what we understand the status of the EIDL uh, program is right now um, that uh, has not been reopened since. It uh, since the funding um, uh, was it, since the funding was used up in that in the first round, and and what I understand um, occurred there was such demand there were so many applications that were received before they ran out of money that uh, they are they have in their systems now all of these applications that were previously received that did not. Uh, that were not processed because, or not funds were not granted because they had run out of money. So they've got that pipeline that they need to address first before they open up 
uh, the portal again for, for new applications. Um, and, and so now that they have this new infusion, this additional fusion of money, they will, they will take those loans that were, were already um, not, uh, uh, not finalized, finalize them, and then uh, determine if, if there are sufficient funds to even reopen it again. My hope is that they will. This is, this is really telling, though, that uh, that less than 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 really three weeks, if you will, um, of of these programs being available for access by the public, that they have they have depleted um, in the first round three hundred forty nine billion dollars for PPP. Second round was three hundred and ten. We're moving through that um, in an extraordinary rate, and and then again. Uh, the funding that was directed for e- EIDL uh, literally gone in a period of, of days. So the demand is clearly there. I think this is going to be one one area of the CARES Act that we're going to have to keep coming back to. Um, we were reminded on a previous call that uh, it may be that that the worst of the of the economic hit is not this summer, but the fact that so many of our Seasonal businesses. Um, uh, they, this is this is the time that they make their money. But will they be able to have a business to come back to next season at this time? And so, uh, the ways that we can be there to help our small businesses. Um, th- this is this is a focus that we have to um, we we have to continue to address. And Caitlin, thanks. And it was good to. Talk to you and several folks in Skagway today. I, the only thing I would add to that was I think there was some, um, you know, part of the confusion is is the cap statutorily is supposed to be two million, but what happened when the CARES Act was originally passed because the funds were being accessed by so many people uh, in round one, they started to put caps. At like thirty or forty thousand dollars, and uh, so that was obviously a much uh, less significant mm-hmm. amount of funding. Although we were able to get a lot of those advanced, uh, really grants out to uh, I think it was uh, about fifteen hundred Alaskans in the first round on the EIDL. Um, so that. So they haven't indicated on this next round, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, the portal is not open yet. They haven't mentioned if the cap is going to go back up again with this being significantly funded again. As soon as we know, we will get that out to everybody. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Senators. Next up, we're going to go to Debbie Rinke, who's got a question for the Senators. Oh, we lost her. Maybe not. All right, I guess we're going to move it along. We'll go to Dwayne and Sitka, who's got a question for the senators. Dwayne, go ahead. Hey, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, both of you for um, – um, doing your hard work on the uh, PPP thing. I'm a seasonal business and uh, getting that changed. Um, so I've got a kind of a two part question. Um, we've got, we got funded on our, our uh, PPP uh, loan on Friday and the new, the, I guess, whatever you want to call it, the legislation came out for the, the seasonal thing. So we weren't able to get in on that. Uh, extremely happy that we got that. So question one was, will we be able to get, because it is a, a fairly substantial difference between uh, the average of um, um, our employees for 12 months versus a four month period, which is you know the main, main time that we're open. And then also um, on that, if you've, if you've received a PPP loan, are you ineligible for the, uh, um, the, envir- the, the disaster loan? And so that's my question. 
So, Dwayne, I can I think take a crack at the the first part or both parts of your question, and um, what we what we wanted to do was make sure SBA and they put out guidance yesterday that um, you can modify the loan that you got on Friday, and uh, we were real we you know we were we we're kind of giving that advice to folks, but we didn't have the definitive statement from SBA that yes you could meaning. Had you got just exactly your situation, you got the loan um, prior to the guidance, and now um, that the uh, um, now that the guidance is out there, that's going to enable you to get a much bigger loan. That was the whole point of us pressing Treasury to do that. We hope that many other seasonal small businesses are gonna um, are gonna take advantage of that. So. Um, you can you can modify the existing PPP uh, loan through the E-Trans system. Some Alaskans are already uh, starting to do that. We're still working with the SBA and Treasury and lenders um, to get specific clarification. Some lenders are already doing this in Alaska, just doing the modification. Others are waiting for a little bit more um, guidance. My uh, recommendation to you is to uh, go back to your lender and and tell them you want to do this. Uh, remind them that these loans are all federally backed. So our, our financial institutions, which are doing a great job in Alaska, um, on getting these loans out. But uh, uh, with the federal government backing the loan, uh, there's no risk to them. And then finally, you can do both the EIDL and PPP but there's a little bit of an issue. You can't, you, you, you can't use them for the same purpose. But uh, again, there's ways in which you can uh, uh, use one for one element of your business and another for an, another ele an element of your business. So um, it just can't be direct overlap. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add. I think Dan outlined both of those um, very, very clearly. I, I do think the first issue that you have raised, though, is one that we're hearing a lot of folks just saying, okay, uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be one of those um, uh, 4,800 uh, original loans through PPP, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really cover um, my, my true payroll as a seasonal business. So the opportunity for modification um, is important. It is significant. I would um, suggest, though, that uh, if you are in this situation, that you move quickly uh, to go back to your lender um, to, to, to do this, because as we saw with the first, uh, the first allocation of funding, that, uh, that we moved through that in, in, in less than two weeks. Um, we know the need is, is is still very very intense, and uh, I think we're going to be in a situation where that fund is going to be tapped out um, pretty quickly here. So I would I would advise all of these seasonal businesses that were able to get the first crack. Um, uh, this is this is the chance to get that modification. And and Dwayne, sorry, one more thing just to add. You know, again, you can work with our offices and the SBA office in Anchorage, which has been helpful in walking banks and the people through this modification. Um, and then just back to your one question, you can, uh, if you got an EIDL loan, and again, there are not many out there, but hopefully they're going to be more out there for our small businesses, you can refinance that into a PPP if you get it later. So that's the other interplay between PPP and EIDL. All right, thanks, Senators. Next up, we're gonna to go to Jeremy Osborne in Anchorage. Hello, Senators. I represent a 501c4 nonprofit organization that works, we're considered essential. We work with bulk fuel facilities in rural Alaska. So as a 501c4 nonprofit, we do not qualify for the payroll protection program, and it doesn't seem like we qualify for the nonprofit rate on the EIDL. 
And so I was wondering if there are any plans to expand sort of the classification of nonprofits in both of those programs, because there's a lot of us who might not be classified as a 501c3, but are still small businesses doing a lot of essential work in Alaska. So you're, okay, you said you were a 501c4? Yes, ma'am. So, um, what what I'm uh, what I'm looking at now is you, you're correct. Um, 501c3, 501c19 are are eligible for the PPP, but I am told that 501c4s and c6s, trade and professional associations, um, are eligible for the EIDL. So at the um, nonprofit rate. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, that's what I'm looking at here. Uh, additionally, um, any nonprofits that don't receive uh, or aren't eligible for PPP would also be eligible would be eligible for the employee retention payroll tax credits, credits mm-hmm. as well as um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. You've got the employee retention payroll tax credit. Under under Section 2301 of the CARES Act, uh, but it you you are eligible uh, as a nonprofit under the EIDL as a C4. Okay. And do you think there's any plans to expand the payroll protection program to the other sorts of nonprofits? You know, I I, I don't know that uh, that that. We have had many discussions about um, uh, expansion to other nonprofits. Uh, I, I do know that making or allowing nonprofits uh, to be able to access these SBA loans was was a significant um, uh, a significant step because, as you know, um, they were not eligible uh, previously to to the CARES Act. Um, so it, it, this may be something that we need to to, to do a little bit more um, uh, poking around here to see how many other C4s uh, are, are 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 looking at this and saying why why are we limited from from being able to access it? Um, it is something that we can look into, though. We can do that for you. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Jeremy. With- Jeremy, I would I would just add to what uh, Lisa said is. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is going to be helpful, um, we're going back in session, and one of the things that I've been encouraging my colleagues, you know, after the CARES Act was passed, we, uh, the Senate, the House went on a recess. I didn't think that was a good idea just because there's so many folks that we knew were, were probably, although we're trying to cover everybody, that weren't going to be covered, not by on purpose, but, you know, mistakes or uh, the, this pandemic is unfolding in so many different ways so quickly. So we can definitely take a look at that. No promises that we'll get it done, but I just think it's a lot more likely that we're going to be back there in the, in the Senate working on these issues daily. It's more likely that these are the kind of things that we can try to address. All right, thank you. Next up, we're going to go to Carol Kerrigan, who's got a question. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, hello, both the senators, and um, thank you for taking my call. I've been on the call a couple times, so I know how popular you guys are. I'm concerned about the post office and what's going on with the post office, and I'm fearful that the mentality is going to be like, oh, we can, you know, save the post office by privatizing it. Oh, we can, you know, do all these things. We can do better than the post office. But Alaskans rely so incredibly much on the post office. I think everybody knows the story about the guy who, you know, shipped bricks one by one wrapped in construction paper out into the bush to try and build a house. And you always see tires and boxes of pilot or red bread and medicines get shipped out. And I just think it's an incredibly vital link. And I think that without the ferry system being the backbone of the state that it has been and the ability to get to some of these remote rural areas and plus 
uh, this thing that's happening with oil, which is another concern of mine, and I'll probably get on next week if I can and talk about that. But I'm really incredibly concerned about the post office and what your positions are to protect it. I'm not asking about what you think about it. I want to know what you're going to do to protect it. So um, I'll sit here and listen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to pose my question. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if it's just in, in Alaska that perhaps we recognize and value what our Postal Service provides for us. Um, you know, in, in, in many communities, if you didn't have the, the Postal Service, you wouldn't have your, your medications. Uh, you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have um, the ability to, to really be out in so many of our communities that are off the road system. So we know how heavily we rely on it and how much we need a reliable postal service. So you're, you're asked about what are we doing. Um, I, I have been very worried about the, just the ongoing stability. Um, part of the biggest challenge that the post office faces, in my view, the biggest challenge, is the fact that they are required to pre-fund retiree benefits. And this is a requirement that is really, it's responsible for the vast, vast majority of Postal Service's financial deficit. And, and so you, you look at that and you say, well, wow, it's just, it, it's just, it's in the red all the time. It must be just poorly mismanaged. It must be just eating up all the taxpayer dollars. We have to, we have to privatize it. We have to do something. I know what we need to do is address this pre-funding requirement. So I have, I'm a, a, a co-sponsor of what we call the U.S. Postal Service Fairness Act, which basically relieves the Postal Service from this requirement to do the pre-funding. Not, not funding of retirement benefits, but pre-funding. So uh, the other thing that I think it's important to know, uh, the, the Postal Service takes a lot of hits from people that I don't think understands how, how it, is, it is structured. Um, almost, almost none of the, uh, of the, of the support um, for the Postal Service comes from the United States taxpayer. Almost entirely uh, the, the, the supports for the Postal Service comes from um, postal products. That's where they get their revenue. They get no federal appropriations except for some small amounts for mailing books to the blind and mailing ballots to Americans that are living overseas. Otherwise, there's no federal support. So they're, they've been making it work, but the thing that drags them under every time is this requirement to do a pre-funding of their retirement benefits. So in the CARES Act, we did provide $10 billion in borrowing authority. Um, that was important. What we're hearing now are some who suggest that they want to have um, um, some, some perhaps more substantive strings attached to uh, to uh, any borrowing authority. That's something that, that we're looking at. Uh, because right now, the, the, the Postal Service, as, as, uh, as other businesses around the, around the country, they're being impacted by, by, the, by the COVID hit. And so I'm, I'm watching uh, the post office very carefully. I, I know we need to do something about this pre-funding requirement, because if we don't, um, it is it's 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 pretty tough to 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 put it on um, just solid foundation financially. So, Carol, I, I don't think I have to add much to that, but I think you get a sense from Senator Murkowski that your ent and entire congressional delegation are stalwart supporters of the post office, and you know we understand, and I think it makes it so vital to our communities. It's a lifeline for so many of our community, but the universal service obligation, that's the mission there, uh, means universal. And so it does, um, it does play a role in our state that's unique in many ways relative to Alaska, which is why we're stalwart supporters, just like bypass mail, 
and other programs that um, that really matter to us that other states might be like, oh, wait, why can't you just drive there? Well, you guys all know why we can't just drive there because so many of our communities don't even have roads. So we uh, are defenders of all of these programs because you can't be treated differently just because you're an American and you live in a village without a road, uh, especially on some of these universal service obligation uh, mandates in federal law for all American citizens. So that's the way we view it, and um, we'll keep focused on that. All right, thank you, Senators. Next up, we're going to go to Colleen Stevens in Valdez, who has a question for the Senators. Hello, Senator Sullivan and Murkowski. Thank you very much for um, creating these opportunities for us to have a voice and for representing us in D.C. My question is relative to the revisions of the PPP, um, which is phenomenal for those of us that are seasonal operators. So thank you for hearing us um, after the original version came out. Um, if we were to apply and receive the increased funds, we still, it's more of a clarification, do we still have the eight week window for the spend or has that also been increased? So Colleen, I'll, uh, I'll answer that and thank you for your leadership on, you know, hearing from you and others. We were very highly motivated to recognize that, you know, one of the ways that we could try to so soften the blow uh, for our seasonal businesses is to is to make this uh, make this change, and so we did do that. Now we were looking at trying to change it legislatively, as you may have heard, and did kind of take a crack at that eight week forgiveness period, uh, but unfortunately that was not in the cards with regard to the to the uh, regulation. So the, for the eight-week forgivable loan period is still only for the eight-week period after the origination of the loan. And I know that's not ideal. Uh, I know that was another concern that a number of our small businesses that were seasonal had. But you now, under the reg, have the ability to choose a 12-week period of your uh, employee base from uh, May 1 through September 15th. That's to, again, get the size of the loan bigger since the PPP is a function of your payroll from last summer. But that eight-week period where the loan is forgivable, if you use it principally for the uh, – uh, paying of your employees is still the eight-week period after the origination loan. That was something we tried to also fix, and in statute it would have worked, but on the reg side, um, that, that was something that we, we, we were unable to get done. I appreciate that clarification, and I think that will help lots of us as we observe what to do. So thank you very much. Okay, next up, we're going to go to Han Cho in Anchorage, who has a question for the senators. Uh, Senator, thank you very much for giving that call. Um, they, uh, they, they threw out the other questions. You answered my questions. Uh, my concern was the two. One is uh, the PPP loan. Uh, I'm a CPA, and I help uh, many small uh, clients apply for their loan, but uh, it is a function of the uh, banks who... Uh, uh, accumulate all the information and submit it to the SBA. And somehow, uh, some banks uh, we are dealing with uh, did not submit those early for the first round. And even for second round, uh, some of my clients they haven't heard from the bank or SBA. And uh, they said uh, until uh, uh, they, they emphasize that uh, funding might not be available, but uh, we have submitted those loans uh, earlier but uh, uh, there is a, a chance that uh, that they might not be able to get the money on, on this round. Uh, is there a possibility that the additional funding might be secured uh, through the legislation? And, and second one, second question. Yeah, second question was uh, 
last uh, eight week period, and because the uh, the business business is still slow, they couldn't find the workers uh, to fill that position. So uh, they might not be able to spend that money on the payroll, uh, so that they get uh, forgiveness. But uh, is there any possibility uh, in the future that may be extended? Thanks very much. Well, I, I do think in, in answer to your question about whether or not there might be a subsequent round of, of funding, um, I, I, all I can do is, is, is just take a guess at this point in time. Um, uh, given, again, the intensity um, of, of the demand that we have seen, not only in Alaska but around the country, um, uh, I think it is clear that uh, we that, that small businesses are, are 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 really starved right now. They're desperate for for the support, and uh, the longer we see um, a, a continuation of our of our local economies um, just kind of on pause or or even slow openings like we're doing in Alaska, I think we recognize that um, time is not making this get any better. It is, not, um, it is not helping any of these small businesses. And so I think this is exactly what we as lawmakers need to be doing is, is to be making sure that uh, the programs that we've put in place are responsive to the need. And when the need is clearly demonstrated, that, uh, that we be responsive with the resources. Now, we've all heard the stories, you know, we've, we've read about them, we've seen them on the evening news about, you know, the Lakers getting, uh, getting millions of dollars and, and big franchise restaurants getting millions of dollars. But uh, the, the, the Treasury is weighing in very, very clearly on, on this. And uh, has has issued guidance as recently as as yesterday, um, just basically making sure that uh, we have some some uh, uh, limitations there on on um, not necessarily who can who can apply for the fund, but if you don't have other sources of of liquidity. And um, and then then you should not be like the Lakers and and apply for this. These are these are resources that were intended um, uh, truly for these smaller businesses that uh, that have been impacted by the the pandemic and 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 for whom their options are are, are more limited. And so. There's there's a there's a close eye that is being given to this, but you will continue to hear uh, of those who uh, have taken advantage of a program that was well intended, uh, and 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 they are not the ones for whom it was intended. So, Han, I would just add to what Senator Murkowski said. Um, we have been hearing, and we've been working very closely with our our banks and credit unions that uh, they've been clearing the backlogs of pending applications and many are now taking new applications. I think all the credit unions have cleared and I think uh, most of the banks have. And more specifically to your question, if you can't, if someone takes uh, the loan and is looking at that eight week period for the loan forgiveness, if they can't hire enough people, they they can always repay the loan penalty free or uh, roll it over into a low interest loan after the eight week period. And remember that, that low interest loan is 1%, no interest or principal for six months and federally guaranteed. So there's still options that you can have if the PPP recipient small business can't bring the workers back and pay them during that eight week period and then they miss that window, 
to have the loan turn into a grant, at least for that eight-week period, which is, of course, one of the real attractions of the PPP program. Okay, thanks, Senators. We're going to sneak in one last question here before we have to wrap up. So we're going to go to Elizabeth Odom on the Kenai, who's got a question for the Senators. Um, hello. I've uh, gotten my question answered already, and but now that I'm on, I just want to say thank you to everybody, Senators. Thank you, workers. Everybody's doing a great job, and everybody be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, That's Elizabeth. Way to wrap it. Yes. All right. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. To those who called in, we appreciate your participation. If you wanted to ask a question of the senators tonight but you weren't able to, please hang on the line after this ends, and you'll be prompted to leave a message, and our offices will work to get you an answer. Uh, with that, have a great evening. Stay safe, and good night.